section forty two of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m piver de senancour translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two eighth year letter sixty four saint saffarin july ten eight the very shadow of good sense is wanting to my present mode of life i am aware however of my follies and if i do not amend it is at the same time without any special determination to persist in them that i am not more serious in my conduct is because i see no great importance in improvement half of the day and night i pass on the lake when the time comes to leave it i shall have grown so accustomed to the equipoise of the waves to the sound of the waters that i shall feel ill at ease on the solid land amidst the silence of the meadows on the one hand i am taken for a man whose mental balance has been a little deranged by love on the other it is thought that i am an englishman suffering from the spleen the young men have taken it on themselves to apprise haunts that i was the lover of a very beautiful foreign lady who has suddenly left lausanne it would seem advisable for me to cease these nocturnal wanderings as i am pitied by the common-sense people while the best take me for a fool hans was asked at vevey are you not in the service of that englishman about whom every one is talking so the evil spreads and as for the dwellers on the coast i believe that they would openly ridicule me if i were not well provided with money as it is i pass for a very wealthy personage the innkeeper insists on addressing me as my lord and altogether i am much respected a rich foreigner and my lord are synonymous terms furthermore when i return from the lake i usually sit down to write so that i go to bed in broad daylight on one occasion the people of the inn hearing some noise in my room and surprised that i had risen so early came up to ask if i would not take anything that morning i replied that i was unaccustomed to supper and that i was just retiring to rest the result is that i do not get up till noon or it may be till one o'clock when i call for tea and again start writing after which in place of dinner i take tea again with nothing in the way of solid food except bread and butter after which i immediately repair to the lake the first time that i ventured out alone in a small boat obtained expressly for the purpose they noticed that hans remained on shore and that i started at the close of day thereupon the frequenters of the inn decided that at last the spleen had got the upper hand and that i was about to furnish a picturesque suicide to the village chronicles i regret now that the effect which might be produced by eccentricities of this kind did not occur to me beforehand i do not care to cause observation but i only began to realize it when the habit was already formed and to change now would not cause less remark than to go on as i have been doing for the few remaining days of my sojourn as if i did not know what to do with myself i sought only how to pass away the time when i am active i am not conscious of other needs but when a prey to weariness i prefer at least to grow weary in idleness tea is a signal assistance in growing weary at one's ease among all the slow poisons which form the delight of humanity i believe that it is one of those best suited to our weariness it imparts feeble but sustained emotion as it is exempt from subsequent revulsion so it degenerates into a habit of peace and indifference into weakness which tranquillizes a heart fatigued by longings and it disembarrasses us of our dolorous energy i took to it at paris and subsequently at lyons but here i have been so imprudent as to carry the habit to excess the only thing that reassures me is that i am shortly to possess an estate with labourers thereon and this will occupy and restrain me at the present time i am doing myself a good deal of injury but rest assured that i shall soon turn wise of necessity i discern or believe i discern that the change which has taken place in me has been much increased by the daily use of tea and wine i think that 
other things being equal the water-drinkers preserve much longer their keenness of sensation and also to some extent their original freshness the use of stimulants causes our organs to grow old those immoderate emotions which are not within the order of natural agreement between external things and ourselves efface the simple emotions and destroy that proportion so full of harmony which renders us alive to all external correspondences when we owe so to speak our sensations only to them such is the human heart and the most essential principle of the penal laws has no other foundation if the proportion between punishment and offence be destroyed if too much recourse be had to the pressure of fear our adaptability is lost and by going further still we end by making shipwreck of ourselves the courage which is required for crime is imparted to certain souls in the weak all energy is extinguished and yet others are driven to virtues of an atrocious order if the emotion of our organs is exalted beyond the natural limits they are rendered insensible to more moderate impressions by employing too often by exciting at undue times their extreme faculties we blunt their normal forces and they are reduced either to excessive activity or to paralysis we destroy that proportion ordained for diverse circumstances which originally united us even to lifeless things and attached us to them by close bonds which left us in expectation or in hope indicating everywhere the occasions of feeling yet leaving us invariably ignorant of the possible limit which permitted us to believe that our hearts had vast capacities because such capacities were indefinite and because always relative to things outside they might always become greater in unknown situations there is also an essential difference between the habit of being actuated by impressions of other objects or by the interior impulsion of an excitation prompted either by our caprice or by a chance incident and not by the lapse of time we follow no longer the course of the world we are animated when it would abandon us to repose and often when it would animate us we are found in the exhaustion produced by our excesses this fatigue this indifference renders us insensible to the impressions of things to those external motives which grown foreign to our habits are found in discordance with our needs or in opposition thereto thus man does everything to cut himself off from the rest of nature to make himself independent of the course of things but this liberty which is in no sense according to his true nature is not true liberty it is rather like the license of a people who have broken from the yoke of the laws and of national habits it takes away more than it gives and substitutes the impotence of disorder in place of a legitimate dependence which would harmonize with our wants such illusory independence which destroys our faculties and substitutes our caprices in place of them puts us in the same position as the man who despite the authority of the magistrate was determined to raise the monument of an alien worship in the market-place instead of being contented to put up an altar thereto in the privacy of his home this person went into exile in the desert where no one could oppose his will but where that will could produce nothing he died there free indeed but without domestic altars as well as without temples without food as well as without laws equally without friends and masters i admit it would be more to the purpose if i reasoned less upon the use of tea and at the same time gave up taking it immoderately but when a habit of this kind has been formed we no longer know where to stop and if it is difficult to give it up it is perhaps not less hard to regulate it at least unless one can equally regulate all one's manner of life i do not know how to exercise great uniformity in one thing when it is forbidden me in the rest or how to be consequent in my way of life when i have no hope either of constancy therein or of a line of conduct which would harmonize with my other habits moreover i do not know how to act in the absence of means many men have the art of creating means or of accomplishing much with few i could perhaps employ my means both with order and utility 
but the first step requires art of another kind and it is precisely this art that i do not possess the difficulty i think arises from my inability to see things otherwise than as a whole so far at least as their extent is within my horizon i desire therefore that their principal proprieties should all be observed and the sentiment of order pushed perhaps too far or at least too exclusively leaves me nothing to do and nothing to conduct amidst disorder i prefer to let myself go far better than to attempt that which i cannot perform well there are certain men who although possessed of nothing set up a household they borrow they intrigue and have the intention of paying when they are able but in the meantime they live and sleep tranquilly and sometimes even succeed i could not make up my mind to earn my living in this manner and even if i resolved to chance it i should not have the necessary talents at the same time any one who by industry of this kind manages to keep his family without debasing himself and without failing in his engagements is undoubtedly a praiseworthy man for myself i am capable of little more than determining to do without everything as if this were a law of necessity i will endeavour always to employ means that are sufficient to the purpose that is best or by personal privations to make those means sufficient which might otherwise be less than enough i would work day and night at things that are regulated suitable and assured so as to give necessities to a friend or to a child but to venture amidst incertitude and make sufficient by the force of a hazardous industry means that are by themselves altogether insufficient cannot be hoped for from me from such a disposition one great inconvenience results namely that i cannot live well prudently and in an orderly manner nor even follow the bent of my inclinations or consider my own requirements except with fairly assured resources and that if i am possibly to be numbered among those who are capable of making good use of what is termed great fortune or even of a comfortable mediocrity i am also one of those who in actual destitution prove to be without resources barely capable of avoiding misery the ridiculous or the degraded when fortune itself does not place them above the reach of want it is generally said that prosperity is more difficult to sustain than adversity but it is quite the opposite for the man who is not subject to positive passions who likes to accomplish thoroughly anything that he takes in hand whose first need is that of order and who considers things as a whole rather than in detail adversity is good for a strong man with a touch of enthusiasm for one whose soul clings to austere virtue and whose mind fortunately for himself does not discern its uncertainty but adversity is very sad and discouraging for him who finds nothing that he can make use of amidst it because it is his desire to do good and power is necessary to activity because he would be useful and the opportunity of being so is seldom granted to an unfortunate unsustained by the noble fanaticism of epictetus he can withstand occasional misfortune but not a life of misfortune against which he rebels in the end realizing that he loses therein all that constitutes his existence the religious man and he above all who is certain of a god who rewards has one great advantage it is very easy to bear up against evil when evil is the greatest good that can be experienced i must confess that i can see nothing so astonishing in the virtue of a man who is doing battle under the eye of his god sacrificing the caprices of an hour to a felicity without limit or end a man who is entirely convinced cannot surely do otherwise unless indeed he has taken leave of his senses it seems to me evident that one who gives way at the sight of gold at the sight of a beautiful woman or at other objects concerned merely with the passions of the earth does not possess faith assuredly he sees nothing clearly but this world did he behold with the same certitude that heaven and that hell which he recalls from time to time were they as present to him as the things of the earth are present it would be impossible for him ever to give way where is the subject who granting that he is in possession of his reason would not find it an utter impossibility to go contrary to the command of his prince did that prince say to him here are all the riches and resources of my palace on condition that for the space of five minutes you shall not touch them 
my eye is upon you if you are faithful for that short time all these possessions and all their delights will be surrendered to your constant enjoyment for the space of thirty years who does not see that such a man however great his desire does not need even strength to restrain himself for so short a period all that he needs is faith in the word of his prince assuredly the temptations of the christian are not stronger and the life of man as compared with eternity is far less than five minutes in comparison with thirty years there is an infinite distance between the felicity promised to the christian and the advantage offered to the subject of whom i am speaking and furthermore about the word of the prince there may be a certain quality of doubt while as to that of god there can be none if therefore it does not stand demonstrated that out of every hundred thousand who are denominated true christians there is at most one who can be said to possess faith it is certain to my mind that nothing in the world can be demonstrated as regards the consequences which follow from this you will find them exceedingly simple and i will return therefore to the wants that are created by the habit of drinking fermented liquors i must do my best to assure you that you should believe in my promise to reform though it is made precisely at a time when i am exercising the least control over myself and have even permitted the habit to acquire greater strength i have first of all another admission to make to you and that is that sleep is beginning to forsake me when i have grown tired of tea i know of no other remedy but wine i can only sleep by having recourse to it and so here is another excess for i must take as much as possible without being visibly affected in the head i know nothing so ridiculous as a man who prostitutes his thought before strangers and makes it possible for them to say that he has been drinking by the way that he behaves and speaks but for the man himself nothing is pleasanter to the rational faculty than to disconcert it a little occasionally i will even claim that a partial excess in private is not less in place than a real excess is shameful in the presence of others and degrading even in secret many of the wines of lavaux which are manufactured between lausanne and vevey are thought unwholesome but when i am alone i make use only of cour taillou which is a wine of neufchatel and is esteemed as much as a small burgundy tissot in fact regards it as equally wholesome when i become a proprietor i shall have every opportunity of passing the hours and in arranging building provisioning and so forth shall be in a position to occupy that internal activity the calls of which leave me no repose amidst inaction while these occupations continue i shall gradually diminish the use of wine and as regards tea i shall give up the habit altogether but which i mean that for the future i shall take it very rarely when all is arranged and i am in a position to start the way of life which i have wished for so long i shall thus be in a position to conform to it without experiencing the inconvenience of a sudden and great change as for the necessities which arise simply out of weariness i trust that i shall know them no longer from the moment that i am able to subjugate all my habits to a general plan i shall fill up the hours easily i shall substitute for desires and enjoyments the interest of accomplishing that which is held to be good and the pleasure of submitting to its true laws i am not however looking forward to a happiness for which i am not destined or which at any rate is still far away for me i am simply imagining that i shall cease to feel the burden of time shall be able to forestall weariness or shall at least weary myself only after my own fashion i have no wish to subject myself to a monastic rule i shall reserve resources for those moments when the void will be most overwhelming but most of them will be found in movement and activity other resources will be kept within narrow limits and the extraordinary itself will be regulated i require a fixed rule in order to fill my life otherwise i should need excesses with no other term than the limit of my powers and even then how would it be possible to fill a void which has no bounds i have seen it said that the man of feeling has no need of wine that may be true for one who has not acquired the habit when i have been sober and occupied for a few days my brain becomes excessively active and sleep is lost i need some excess to draw me out of my restless apathy and to derange slightly that divine reason whose true powers weary our imagination while they do not fill our hearts there is one thing which surprises me i come across people who seem to drink simply for the gratification of the palate 
for purposes of taste who in fact take a glass of wine as they would take some sweetened cordial it is not quite the case all the same but they believe it to be so and if you were to ask them about it they would be quite surprised at the question it is my intention to forbid myself this method of deluding the craving for pleasure and the futility of the hours whether what i shall put into its place will not prove of even less account i do not know but at least i shall be able to say that here is an established rule which it is necessary to follow but in order to follow it constantly i must avoid both scrupulous exactitude and excessive uniformity some pretext some motive even should be found for breaking the rule and once broken there is no reason why it should not be cast aside altogether it is desirable that what pleases us should be limited by an anterior law when pleasure is actually experienced it is troublesome to adhere to any rule designed to limit it even those who would have strength enough for this purpose would be wrong not to have decided during the periods proper for reflection that which should be decided by reflection they would be wrong to wait for the moment when such reasonings would alloy the agreeable affections which they are forced to obey by recalling the reasons which forbid further enjoyment that enjoyment which we do permit ourselves is reduced to a very small thing it is of the nature of pleasure that it should be possessed with a kind of abandon and plenitude it fades when we seek to limit it otherwise than by necessity and since it is necessary notwithstanding that reason should limit it the only way that we can reconcile both these things which otherwise are in opposition is by imposing beforehand on pleasure the restraint of a general law though an impression may be altogether feeble the moment when it acts upon us is that of a species of passion the actual thing can scarcely be estimated at its true value as for example among the objects of sight dimensions are increased by proximity and presence close at hand the principles by which it is intended to moderate desires must be established before these are experienced in the actual moment of passion the recollection of this rule is no longer the importunate voice of cold reflection but the law of necessity and this law will not trouble a wise man it is therefore essential that the law should be general that of particular cases is under too strong suspicion at the same time something should be abandoned to circumstances this is a liberty which we should preserve because it is impossible to foresee everything and we should moreover submit ourselves to our own laws only after the same manner that our nature has subjugated us to those of necessity there should be independence in our affections but at the same time an independence contained within limits which it must not overstep they are similar to the motions of the body if these are embarrassed constrained or too uniform they can have no grace while on the other hand they are wanting both in decency and utility if they are too sudden irregular or involuntary it is an excess in order itself to pretend to harmonize perfectly to moderate and regulate one's enjoyments and to arrange them with rigid economy so as to make them durable and as it were perpetual such absolute regularity is very rarely possible pleasure attracts and carries us with it just as sadness restrains and binds us we live in the midst of dreams and of all our dreams that of a perfect order may well be the least natural i find it difficult to realize how it is that people seek intoxication from liquors when they have the intoxication of other things is not the stimulus of our passions to be sought in the need of emotion when we are agitated by them what can we find in wine unless it be a repose which suspends their immoderate action it would appear that the man of great responsibility seeks in wine oblivion and calm rather than energy thus coffee while it excites me sometimes brings sleep to my brain which has been fatigued by some other agitation it is not usually the need of strong impressions which leads strong souls to excess in wines or liqueurs a strong soul occupied with great things finds in their pursuit and their orderly government an activity more worthy of itself wine can only bring it rest were it otherwise why have so many heroes of history so many rulers so many masters of the world been in the habit of drinking hard drinking was regarded as an honourable thing by more than one nation yet many remarkable men had recourse to it when no such glory was attributed to it i leave therefore all those who were carried away by opinion and all those rulers who were only ordinary persons there remain some strong men occupied over things which were useful and such have been able to find 
in wine alone repose for a brain overcharged with cares the urgency of which was minimized by the habit yet without destroying that urgency since there was no escape from it end of section forty two section forty three of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m piver de senancour translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two eighth year letter sixty five saint saffarin july fourteen eight you may rest assured that i shall offer no opposition to your views should my weakness require me to be some day restored to reason over this matter i should then recur to your letter my feeling of shame would be deeper because some great change must have previously come over me for at the present time i think absolutely as you do until then if it be useless in this respect your letter does not gratify me less it is full of that solicitude of true friendship which dreads above all things that a man to whom we have so to speak transferred a part of ourselves should allow himself to lapse from virtue no i shall never forget that money is one of the great instruments of man and that by its use he shows what he is the best possible is rarely granted us conditions i mean are so opposed that to do good under all circumstances is next to impossible i regard it as essential to live with a certain decency managing my household affairs on an easy scale and by a regulated method but setting this aside it is inexcusable for a reasonable person to waste on superfluities that which can be applied to better things no one is yet aware that i intend taking up my abode in this place but i am having some furniture and a number of other effects brought from lausanne and vevey some have therefore concluded that i am rich enough to sacrifice a considerable amount to the caprices of a transitory sojourn and that it is my intention to hire a house for the summer hence they have inferred that i am extravagant and though it is thought that i am slightly out of my mind i have earned a good deal of respect in consequence those who have better class houses to let do not approach me as they would an ordinary individual and for myself i am tempted to offer much the same homage to my louis when i think that one person is already being made happy hans gives me ground for hope if he is contented with so little concern on my part others perhaps will be so now that it is possible for me to do something want weariness and uncertainty tie your hands even over matters which are not ruled by money it is impossible to arrange anything or to follow any defined plan encompassed by men who are overwhelmed by misfortune though possessing some external advantage we can do nothing to assist them nor even make our inability known so that they may not cherish resentment where is he who dreams of the fecundity of wealth men lose it as they squander their powers their health and their years it is so easy to hoard it or waste it so difficult to employ it well there is a cure of my acquaintance near freiburg who is ill-clothed ill-nourished and does not spend a stiver unnecessarily he gives everything away and also gives intelligently one of his parishioners i hear talks about his avarice but such avarice is admirable when we think of the importance of time and that of money it is painful to witness the loss of a single moment or a single penny all the same we are borne away by the flux of events and while some arbitrary convention consumes twenty louis a necessitous person fails to obtain a crown chance brings us or takes away far more than would be necessary to console the unfortunate another chance condemns to inactivity the man whose genius might have saved a country a bullet destroys a second of whom great things were predicted and who had been gradually prepared for them by the experience of perhaps thirty years 
amidst such uncertainty and under such a law of necessity what becomes of all our calculations and all exactitude in details apart from this incertitude one would not wish for cambric handkerchiefs cotton ones would answer just as well and would enable us to give something to the poor journeyman artisan who goes without his tobacco when he is at work inside a house because he has no handkerchief which he can dare to use before everybody such a life as this excellent cure leads must be a happy one and if i were pastor of a village i should make haste to do likewise before confirmed habit made comforts indispensable to me but celibacy solitude and independence of the world's opinion would be requisite for without these excessive exactitude might prevent me transcending the limits of so narrow a sphere of utility to dispose one's life in this way is to limit it too closely and yet depart from it and you are at once made subject to all those conventional wants the scope of which it is difficult to define and which carry us so far away from the true order that people with a revenue of twenty thousand livres will shrink from an expenditure of twenty francs we do not sufficiently realize the feelings of a woman who dragging herself along a road with her child wanting bread for herself and for him at last picks up or receives a silver coin she then enters with confidence some lodging where there will be straw for both before retiring to rest she can make a bread pudding she falls asleep quickly and sleeps with contentment leaving the needs of the morrow to providence what evils to foresee and to repair what consolations to impart what pleasures to ensure all of which are so to speak contained in one purse of gold like secret and forgotten seeds waiting only the thoughtfulness of a generous heart in order to bear rich fruit a whole country is miserable and depressed necessity unrest disorder have discouraged all hearts all men suffer and chafe evil temper dissension sickness poor nourishment brutal education shameful habits all may be changed universal order peace confidence all can be restored including hope itself and good manners o oh, fruitfulness of money he who has adopted a definite way of life whose life can therefore be regulated whose income is always the same who lives within his income is circumscribed thereby just as a man is governed by the laws of his nature the heir to a small patrimony a country minister a quiet man of means all these can calculate what they have fix their annual expenditure reduce their personal wants to absolute necessities and then set aside whatever little may remain for an enjoyment which will not perish no single coin should leave their hands without bringing pleasure or repose to the heart of some unfortunate i enter with affection this patriarchal kitchen under a simple roof in the corner of the valley i see vegetables prepared with milk because it costs less than butter soup is made from herbs because the meat broth has been taken to a sick person at half a league away from the house the best fruits are sold in the town and the produce enables some measures of maize flour to be distributed among the needier women of the district not as alms but on the pretence of material for making puddings and cakes the wholesome fruits which are not costly such as cherries gooseberries and the ordinary grape are consumed with as much relish as the fine pears or peaches which are not more refreshing and are devoted to a better purpose in the house all is clean but rigorous in its simplicity had avarice or penury constituted this rule it would be sad to behold but in this case it is the economy of benevolence the methodical privations the voluntary severity are sweeter than all the resources and lavishness of a voluptuous life these latter become necessities the privation of which is intolerable yet in which no pleasure is centred the former furnish enjoyment ever repeated and yet leaving us our independence 
the clothes of children and father are generally of strong materials in texture and not easily soiled the wife wears only a white cotton dress and every year some pretext is found for distributing two hundred ells of linen among those who except for such bounty might scarcely possess undergarments there is no china in the house with the exception of two japanese cups which have long done service in the family everything else is made of hard wood pleasing to the eye and kept with extreme cleanness it breaks with difficulty and can be renewed at very little cost so that there is no need to fear anxiety or complaint there is order without bad temper and activity without inquietude there are no servants in the house its cares being few and under good regulation the work is done by the family in order to preserve its freedom furthermore they do not like either to be on the watch or to suffer loss and are happier with extra work provided that it increases confidence there is however one woman once a beggar who comes for an hour daily to do the roughest part of the labour and on each occasion she carries away her stipulated recompense with this kind of life they know their expenditure to a penny they know also the value of an egg and how to give away without regretting it a sack of flour to the poor debtor persecuted by a rich creditor it is essential to the order itself that it should be followed without repugnance actual wants are easy to confine by custom within the limits of what is simply necessary but the wants of weariness are without limits and they lead furthermore to additional wants of fancy as illimitable as themselves here everything has been foreseen so that no distaste may interfere with the harmony of the whole they make no use of stimulants which render our sensations irregular causing at once avidity and exhaustion wines and coffee are alike interdicted tea alone is permitted but not under any circumstances more often than once every five days no festivals come to trouble imagination by anticipated enjoyment by indifference whether unforeseen or affected or by the revulsion and the weariness which succeed equally to frustrated or satisfied desires all days are pretty much alike in order that all may be happy when some are for pleasure and some are for work the man that is not compelled by necessity soon becomes discontented with everything and curious to make a trial of some other mode of living the incertitude of our hearts requires either uniformity to fix it or perpetual variety to keep it in suspense and fascination amusements involve expenditure and thus in the weariness of pleasures one loses not only personal contentment but the opportunity of being beloved in the midst of a contented village at the same time it does not follow that every hour of life should be insipid and joyless we may become accustomed to the uniformity of weariness but character is altered thereby the disposition becomes hard or morose and in the midst of the peace of things there is no longer the peace of the soul or the calm of happiness realizing this our excellent cure is anxious that the services which he renders and the order which he has established should confer upon his family the felicity of a simple life and not the bitterness of privations and of misery each day brings the children its period of enjoyment of such a kind that it is possible to renew it daily no day ever ends without amusement for them and without their parents having the pleasure of parents that namely of seeing their children always growing happier while always growing better the evening meal is taken early and consists of simple but pleasing viands which they often prepare for themselves after supper there are games in common at home or at the houses of their neighbours running walking the gaiety so necessary for children and so good at any age these things never fail them so much is the master of the house convinced that happiness depends on virtue as virtue disposes to happiness this is how life should be led here is how i should choose to lead it above all if i had a considerable revenue but you know what chimera i nourish in my thoughts i do not believe in it and yet i do not know how to reject it 
fortune which has given me neither wife nor children nor fatherland but has condemned me to i know not what of isolated restlessness which has always prevented me from taking any part in the world as other men do my destiny in a word retains me always in the struggle of endeavour from which it never permits me to escape it does not indeed dispose of me but it prevents me disposing of myself it would seem as if there is some force which restrains and prepares me secretly that my life has some terrestrial end still unknown and that i am reserved for something as to which i have no conception this may be perhaps an illusion and yet i cannot voluntarily dismiss what i think i foresee and what time may actually have in reserve for me as a fact i might settle myself here very nearly in the way of which i speak my object would indeed be insufficient but it would at least be certain and seeing plainly to what i must henceforth be devoted i should compel myself to occupy in this daily course the disquietude which impels me assuring within a narrow circle the good of a few men i should gradually forget how useless i am to the race at large i might possibly adopt this course if i did not find myself in an isolation which would deny me all interior sweetness if i had a child whose character i could form whose progress i should follow in all its details had i a wife who loved the cares of a well-conducted household who would naturally enter into my views who would find pleasure in domestic familiarity and enjoy like myself all those things which have no other value than that of a voluntary simplicity i should soon be contented to follow order in the things of private life an obscure valley would be for me the sole habitable earth suffering would exist there no longer and i should thus be contented as in a few years i shall be only a handful of dust which even the worms will have abandoned i might even come to regard the spring from which i obtained an inexhaustible supply of water as an adequate monument and it would be enough for the enjoyment of my days if ten families found my existence useful in a suitable locality i should enjoy the simplicity of the mountain more than the luxurious ways of great towns my floor would be of planks of pine and in place of polished woods i should have pine walls my furniture would also be pine and not mahogany i should enjoy setting chestnuts in the ashes on the kitchen hearth as much as i enjoy being seated on some elegant article of furniture twenty feet distant from a drawing-room fire and in the light of forty wax candles but i am alone and beyond this reason i have yet others for doing differently did i know who will share my way of living i should know in accordance with what requirements and what tastes i should have to arrange it could i be sufficiently useful in my domestic life i should see that i limited thereto every consideration of the future but ignorant as to those with whom i am destined to live and also as to what will become of me i have no wish to sever relations which may become indispensable and i must not adopt habits that are too individual my arrangements will therefore be made in accordance with the places that i am in but in such a manner that i shall not estrange from me any of those who can be said to be one of ourselves my fortune is not considerable and otherwise i should scarcely introduce into an alpine valley any misplaced luxuries such scenes consort with the simplicity that i like not that excesses are unknown there or even fanciful wants perhaps it can scarcely be said that the country is itself simple but it suits simplicity ease of circumstance is pleasanter there than elsewhere and luxury is less attractive many natural things are not as yet ridiculous it is not a place that should be chosen if one is reduced to a pittance but any one who has just enough is better off there than elsewhere i am consequently making my plans as if i were fairly certain of passing my life therein and i shall establish in all things a method of living such as circumstances indicate after i have provided for necessities my remaining income will not exceed eight thousand livres per annum but this will be sufficient and will embarrass me less than double the sum in an ordinary place or four times the amount in a large town End of section forty three
section forty four of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m piver de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two eighth year letters fifty six and fifty seven letter fifty six july nineteen eight those who dislike a change of servants should be satisfied with one whom custom will let them make use of pretty much as they will my own accommodates himself very fairly to my requirements if i am indifferently fed he is satisfied in this respect to be a little better off than his master if beds being wanting i have recourse for the night to some hay without undressing he makes shift after the same manner and does not render me too sensible of his condescension which in turn i do not abuse and have therefore had a mattress procured for him for the rest it suits me to have a person about me who is independent of me strictly speaking people who can do nothing on their own initiative and are forced naturally and by inaptitude to owe everything to another are too difficult to deal with never having acquired anything as the result of their own efforts they have had no opportunity to learn the value of things or to undergo voluntary privations and hence all these are hateful to them they do not distinguish between penury and reasonable economy or between a sordid condition and the momentary discomfort imposed by circumstances hence their wants are so much the less limited because without you they could aspire to nothing leave them to themselves and they will scarcely earn coarse bread take them under your charge and they despise vegetables butcher's meat is too common and water disagrees with their constitution here i am at last in my own domicile and that too in the alps not so many years since this would have been a great happiness now it is merely a pleasure that i have found something to do i have engaged workmen from la gruyere to build me a wooden house with stoves after the fashion of the country i have started by raising a spacious roof covered with ancel to connect the barn with the house and having the wood-house and the well beneath it at the present moment this answers for the common workshop while some shanties have been hastily knocked up wherein we pass the night so long as the clemency of the season permits it in this way the builders are not inconvenienced and the work advances the quicker they make their kitchen in common so here i am at the head of a midget state at once industrious and united hans my prime minister does not disdain to eat with the workmen occasionally i have led him to understand that although he is the intendant of my buildings in order to be loved by my people he must in no sense despise persons of free condition peasants and craftsmen considering that the philosophy of the age may give them sufficient assurance to term him a valet if you have a moment to spare let me have your ideas as to any details which may occur to you so that in arranging things for a considerable time to come perhaps even for life i may do nothing which i shall have to alter subsequently write to me at imenstrom near vevey letter fifty seven imenstrom july twenty four eight my hermitage is not illuminated by the morning rays at any season and save in the winter it scarcely beholds the setting sun about the summer solstice there is no twilight and the dawn is perceptible only some three hours after it has appeared on the horizon it is then visible between the straight stems of the pine trees hard by a bare summit soaring higher than the sun into heaven but whereon its light is thrown it seems borne upon the breast of the torrent above the fall thereof with surpassing brilliance its beams are broken over the black wood its luminous disc sleeps upon the wild and umbrageous mountain while the slopes are still in shadow it shows like the glittering eye of some swarthy colossus but it is most at the approaches of the equinox that the evenings will be wonderful and truly deserving of a younger eye the gorge of immenstrom descends opening towards the winter sunset 
the southern slope will be in darkness while this which looks towards the south and of which i have taken possession all glorified with the splendour of the setting sun will behold that sun quenched in the vast lake emblazoned by the fires thereof then will my deep valley be as a refuge of equable temperature between the burning plain exhausted by the long glare and the frozen snow of the summits which stand round it to the east i have seventy roods of very fair meadow land twenty of excellent woodland and nearly thirty-five more of which the surface is part rock part wet and shady marshland and the remainder covered with either thin or impenetrable woodland this portion will yield practically no produce it is essentially a barren tract from which no other advantage is derived than the pleasure of enclosing it as one's own and of being able at will to arrange it to one's own liking what pleases me best in this property outside its situation is that it is very compact and can be included in a common enclosure it contains moreover no fields and no vineyard possibly the vine might answer if the timber were cleared once upon a time there would seem to have been actually a vineyard which has now been replaced by chestnut trees and these i prefer very much wheat answers badly rye it is said would do well but would serve only as an article of exchange and for this purpose cheeses would be more convenient it is my ambition to simplify all household toils and cares thus ensuring order and the least possible embarrassment on this account i have no desire for vines as they entail great labour and though i would have a man occupied i would not have him overburdened their produce furthermore is too irregular and uncertain and i prefer to know my possibilities and resources nor do i care for fields because the work which they entail is unequal while hailstorms and here especially the frosts of the month of may too easily injure the harvest and lastly their aspect is generally speaking either disagreeable or indifferent to me pasture woodland and fruit these are all that i ask for especially in this country unfortunately fruit is scanty at Immenstrom. this is a serious drawback long waiting is indispensable for the enjoyment of the trees which are planted by one's self and i who like to be in security as to the future while yet counting only on the present have no great fancy for waiting as here there was no house so also there were no fruit trees except some chestnuts and very old plum trees which apparently go back to the period when the vineyard was in existence and so also doubtless something in the way of habitations the ground indeed appears to have been broken up into several holdings but subsequent to their unification it has served as pasturage for cows going up to the mountains in spring and coming down for the winter this autumn and the spring following i shall plant a good many apples and wild cherries with some pears and some plums as regards other fruit trees i prefer to dispense with them for they could be obtained only with difficulty i conclude that one is tolerably well off with the native products of any given place and that the pains which are involved in securing what a climate will afford only with trouble cost more than such things are worth for a similar reason i shall make no pretence to secure everything that might be held necessary or for which i could find a use there is much that it will be better to obtain by the way of exchange in a large domain i do not of course disapprove of making everything on the spot linen bread wine of having pigs in the yard turkeys peacocks guinea fowl rabbits whatsoever under good management might prove advantageous but i have observed with some astonishment those squalid and ill-regulated households where with a view to an economy which is always precarious and often burdensome a hundred anxieties a hundred occasions of bad temper a hundred opportunities for loss are indiscriminately adopted all rural occupations are useful but most of them only when they can be arranged easily on a somewhat considerable scale otherwise it is far better to stick to a special avocation and see to that thoroughly by simplification the routine is rendered more easy the mind is less restless servants are more faithful and domestic life is much pleasanter could i make annually a hundred pieces of linen i might entertain the notion of the connected inconvenience in my home 
but for the sake of a few ells shall i start sowing hemp and flax be it all the pains of steeping the raw material picking it employing spinners sending i know not where to have it made into linen and elsewhere still for its bleaching if everything were carefully calculated losses peculations work ill done indirect costs all taken into account i am convinced that i should find my linen unusually costly in place of this i selected as i please independently of all such care i pay only what it is actually worth because i purchase a quantity at a time from a store in addition to this i do not change my merchants like workmen or domestics except when it is impossible to do otherwise and this whatever may be argued occurs rarely when selection has been made with the intention of not altering and when a man on his own part does that which is just for their satisfaction end of section forty four section forty five of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by a t m piver de senancourt translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two eighth year letter sixty eight Immenstrom, july twenty three eight the same idea has occurred to both of us as regards my new asylum i confess that a moderate degree of cold is to me as objectionable as a very great degree of heat i detest north winds and snow from the earliest times my inclinations turn towards those pleasant climates where winter is unknown and at one time i thought it so to speak absurd for any one to live at archangel or yenisic i have still a difficulty in realizing that commerce and the arts can be pursued in some lost place near the pole where during so long a season all liquids are solid the earth is in a state of petrification and the outward air mortal it is the north which appears to me uninhabitable as for the torrid zone i cannot understand why it was so regarded by the ancients its sands are sterile undoubtedly but one cannot help feeling that regions which are otherwise well watered must be more suitable to man making his needs few and ministering with the products of a plentiful and continuous vegetation to the one absolute want which he experiences snow it is said has its advantages and this is certain for it fertilizes ground which is naturally wanting in fertility but i should prefer places which are productive by nature or can be rendered so by other means snow has also its beauties and this must be the case for beauty is to be found in all things when they are considered under all their aspects the beauties of snow are however the last which i should personally discover but now that independent life is for me only as a forgotten dream now that i should perhaps seek nothing but to remain unmoved so long as hunger cold or weariness do not compel me to activity i begin to judge climates reflectively rather than sentimentally for passing the time as i best can in my room the frozen sky of the samoides does as well as the mild heaven of ionia what i might have most reason to fear would possibly be the unvarying fine weather of hot countries where the oldest inhabitant has only seen rain a dozen times fine days are very convenient but in spite of the cold the mists and the melancholy i can better tolerate the weariness of the bad weather than the weariness of the beautiful season i do not sleep so well as i used to and the restlessness of the nights combined with the desire for repose make me think of the insect scourges which torment men in tropical countries and even in the summer season of several northern regions the deserts are no longer for me the needs created by convention have become my natural needs of what consequence to me is the independence of man i require money and with money i can be as well off at st petersburg as at naples 
in the north man is subjugated by necessities and by obstacles in the south he is enslaved by indolence and pleasure in the north the destitute person has no asylum he is naked cold hungry and nature for him is no less terrible than the almshouse or the prison at the equator he has forests and nature may suffice him so long as man is absent there at least he can find an asylum from misery and oppression but for myself bound as i am by my habits and my destiny i am forbidden to travel so far i seek but a convenient cell where i can breathe sleep remain in the warmth walk up and down and keep account of my expenses it is much therefore to have built one hard by an overhanging and frowning rock hard by a foaming torrent things which remind me from time to time that i might have done differently notwithstanding i must own that i did think of lugano and even had a mind to see it but this i have renounced the climate is temperate you are spared on the one hand the intense heat of the italian plains and on the other the rough alternations and excessive cold of the alps snow falls there rarely and does not remain when it falls there are said to be lovely olive trees and the scenery is beautiful at the same time it is an out-of-the-way corner more even than this do i fear the italian manner and when over and above that i remember its stone-built houses i cease to trouble about it it meant practically giving up switzerland chessel i should have liked far better and that is where i ought to be but it does not seem that i can i have been led here by a power which is perhaps only the result of my first dreams of switzerland yet it seems of another order lugano has a lake but a lake could be no adequate reason for leaving you that part of switzerland where i have fixed my abode has become so to speak my country or at least it is like a country where i have passed happy years at the first period of my life i dwell here now with indifference and this is a great proof of my misfortune yet i think that it would be ill with me elsewhere this lovely basin which forms the eastern end of lake leman so vast so romantic so finely surrounded these wooden houses these chalets these kine which come and go carrying their mountain bells the facilities of the plains and the proximity of the high peaks a kind of manner which is english french and swiss one language that i know another which is my own and a third more seldom heard that i do not understand a tranquil variety which all this helps to impart a certain union little known among catholics the mildness of a region which looks westward and is sheltered from the north the long expanse of rounded water prolonged indefinite with far-off vapours exhaling under the noonday sun or flaming in the lights of evening where night makes audible the waves which form flow up gather and widen out to be lost upon the margin where i am resting all this sustains man in a situation which he does not find elsewhere i can scarcely be said to enjoy it and yet i should find difficulty in dispensing with it i should be a stranger in other places i might look for more picturesque scenery and when i compare with external things the impotence and nothingness of my life i might know what to complain of here i can attribute it only to vague desires and elusive needs i must therefore seek in myself those resources which may be there without my knowing it and if my impatience is without remedy my uncertainty is at least indefinite i must confess that i like to possess even when i cannot enjoy whether the vanity of things leaving me no room for further hope inspires me with a sadness which is suitable to the bent of my thought whether having no other enjoyment to expect i find a certain sweetness amidst a bitterness which does not exactly cause suffering but leaves the soul discouraged in the repose of a painful effeminacy so much indifference for things attractive by themselves and once desired sad evidence of the insatiable hunger of our hearts still flatters their disquiet it appears to the ingenuity of their ambition a mark of our superiority over that which is sought by men and over all things which nature has granted us as sufficiently great for man 
i could wish to be familiar with the whole earth not indeed to see it but to have once seen it life is too short for me to overcome my natural indolence i who dread the smallest journey and sometimes even a simple removal shall i set myself to scour the wide world so as to obtain if by chance i come back the rare advantage of knowing two or three years before my end some few things which would be useless to me let him undertake voyages who can reckon on his means who prefers novel sensations who anticipates success or enjoyment from that which he does not know for whom to travel is to live i am not a man of arms a merchant or a sightseer nor yet a learned person nor a man who has systems i am a poor observer of even everyday things and i should come back from the farthest end of the world with nothing that was of any use to my country at the same time i could have wished to have seen the world and to have returned to my hermitage with the certainty of never leaving it i am fit only to end my days in peace you will remember no doubt that once when we were speaking of the way that time was passed on board ship with pipe punch and playing cards i who detest cards who do not smoke and drink very little made no other answer than to get my feet into my slippers lead you into the breakfast-room shut down the window quickly and start walking up and down with you over the carpet near the hob where the kettle was boiling and you still speak to me about travelling i repeat to you that i am only fit to end my days managing my house in mediocrity simplicity comfort so that my friends may be contented therein about what else should i disquiet myself and why should i pass my life in making preparations for living yet a few summers yet a few winters and your friend the great traveller will be a handful of ashes you will remind him that he ought to be useful and this is indeed his hope for he will furnish some few ounces of earth to the earth from which he came only trusting that it will be in europe if other things were possible to me i should set myself to their performance i should regard them as a duty and that might stimulate me a little but as far as i am concerned myself there is nothing that i wish to do if i can contrive not to be alone in my wood-built house if i can contrive that all therein shall approach happiness it will be said that i am a useful man though personally i believe nothing of the kind it is not being useful to do with money what money can do everywhere and to improve the condition of two or three persons when there are men who either lose or save myriads of their kind however this may be i shall feel some contentment in seeing contentment about me in my isolated room i shall forget all the rest i shall become as narrow as my destiny and may perhaps even get to believe that my valley is an essential part of the world what then would be the use of my having seen the globe and why should i desire to see it i must try to tell you in order to know myself in the first place you are right in thinking that regret for not having seen it affects me very little had i a thousand years to live i would start to-morrow as this is not the case the narratives of cook norden and pallas tell me anything about other countries that i can have any need to know but if i had seen them i should compare one sensation with another of the same order under another sky i should perhaps see a little more clearly into the relations between man and things and as it is necessary for me to write because i have nothing else to do i might perhaps be able to say things that were less useless dreaming alone with no light on some rainy evening by a good fire settling slowly into ashes i should like to say to myself i have seen the sands the seas the mountains i have seen capitals and deserts i have seen nights in the tropics and nights in the polar regions i have seen the southern cross and the little bear i have endured heat at one hundred and forty five degrees and cold at one hundred and thirty i have traversed snows at the equator and beheld the flush of day in carnadine the pine trees within the arctic circle i have compared the simple outlines of caucasus with the rugged alps and the forests of mount felix with the bare granite of the thebaid i have seen ireland always humid and libya always arid i have known the long winter of edinburgh without suffering from cold i have seen the camels frozen in abyssinia i have ground pepper i have taken opium i have drunk ava 
i have sojourned in a small village where they would have cooked me if they did not think that i was poison then among a people who adored me because i arrived there in one of those globes in which europeans amuse themselves i have seen the eskimo content with bad fish and whale oil i have seen the merchant dissatisfied with his wines of cyprus and constance i have seen the freeman pursuing the bear for a hundred leagues and the tradesman eat grow fat weigh out his merchandise and wait for extreme unction in the sombre shop where his mother drew trade before him a mandarin's daughter dies of shame because her husband sees one of her feet uncovered an hour too soon in the pacific two girls mount on the bridge and covered by a single garment advance among the foreign sailors lead them to land and are delighted at the sight of a vessel the savage kills himself with despair before the destroyer of his friend the true believer sells the woman who loved saved and nourished him and secures a higher price because he has made her a mother but when i had seen these things and many others when i could say that i had seen them o oh, men deceived and made for deception do you not know them are you less fanatical in your narrow ideas have you less reason to be so that some small decency may remain to you no it is but a dream it is far better to buy oil wholesale to sell it retail and make two sous per pound what i could say to the thinking man would not have much higher authority our books may suffice to the impartial man and all the experience of the globe is in our libraries he who has seen nothing for himself but is without prejudice knows more than many travellers no doubt if a man of this upright mind if such an observer had scoured the world he would know still more but the difference would not be enough to be essential he can discern in the remarks of others the things which they themselves have not noticed but which he would have seen in their place if anacharsis pythagoras democritus live now it is probable that they would not have travelled because everything has been divulged the secret science is no longer hidden in a particular place there are no longer any unknown manners any extraordinary institutions and it is no longer indispensable to go abroad were it necessary to see everything by itself now that the earth is so great and knowledge so complicated all life would be insufficient for the multiplicity of things which it would be necessary to study or for the number of places to be visited we no longer journey these great distances because their object grown too vast has passed beyond the faculty and even the hope of man how therefore should they be suited to my limited faculty or to my extinguished hope what more shall i say to you the servant who tends her cows who lets her milk stand who removes the cream and churns it knows well that she is making butter when she serves it sees that it is spread with satisfaction over the bread and that more tea is placed in the teapot because the butter is good she feels that her pains are repaid her toil is beautiful to her because she has done what she wished but when a man seeks that which is just and useful does he know what he will produce or whether he will produce anything truly this gorge of immense strom is a place full of tranquillity where above me i see only the black fir tree the bare rock the infinite sky and far down stretches the earth which is tilled by man in other ages the duration of life used to be reckoned by the number of springtides and as one to whom it is necessary that his wooden roof should become like that of the man of old i shall thus reckon what remains to me by the number of times that you come here to pass according to your promise one month of each year in my company End of section forty five Section forty six of Obermann. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Obermann by A. T. M. Piver de Senancourt, translated by Arthur Edward Waite, eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two. Eighth year, letters sixty nine and seventy letter sixty nine immenstrom july twenty seven eight i learn with much satisfaction that m de fonsalbe 
has returned from st domingo but he is said to be a ruined man and more than that he is married i hear further that he has business at zurich and must repair thither speedily advise him to take this place on his way he will be well received warn him notwithstanding that in other respects he must look for indifferent cheer such things matter little to him i believe unless he has changed much he is an excellent heart does a good heart ever change i should obtrude but very slight sympathy over the demolition of his home by a hurricane or the destruction of his prospects if he were not married but as things are i commiserate him greatly if his wife be a wife in truth it will be deplorable for him to see her anything except happy if he be accompanied only by a woman who bears his name he will have a full share of those mortifications from which easy circumstances alone can offer an escape i have failed to hear whether or not he has children make him promise to take vevey on his way and to stay here for several days the brother of madame delamar may well be cut out for me a hope inspires me tell me something about him you who know him better felicitate his sister on his escape from the last misfortune of the passage home yet no say nothing to her as from me suffer the past to perish but advise me when he will come and tell me in our own language what you think of his wife i trust that she accompanies him on his journey in a sense it is even necessary that this is the time of all others for visiting switzerland is a pretext which will serve you to determine them should there be any question of embarrassment or expense assure her that she can remain comfortably and becomingly at vevey while he concludes his business at zurich letter seventy imenstrom july twenty nine eight though my last letter was dispatched only the day before yesterday i am writing to you again without i must confess having anything special to tell you should both communications come to hand together do not assume that there is anything urgent in this one i forewarn you that it carries no news unless indeed that it has become suddenly winter here which will at once account for my writing and for the fact that i am spending the afternoon by the fire snow clothes the mountains the clouds hang low an icy rain is deluging the valleys it is cold even by the shore of the lake at midday it was only five degrees above freezing point and it was under two a little before sunrise i do not dislike these winters in miniature supervening in the heart of summer within given limits variation is good even for regular people for those even who are ruled by their habits some organs become fatigued by incessant action just now i am thoroughly enjoying the fire whereas it irritates me in the winter and i go away from it vicissitudes of the kind which we are experiencing more sudden and more marked than in the plains render the inconvenient temperature of the mountains to some extent of greater interest a dog is not most attached to that master who feeds him well and allows him abundance of rest but to the one who corrects and caresses scolds and pardons him an irregular stormy uncertain climate becomes a necessary minister to our restless mood while one that is more accommodating and regular though it contents yet leaves us indifferent possibly the equable days the cloudless sky the perpetual summer are more stimulating to the imagination of the multitude because then the prime needs of humanity monopolize less of their time and people are more uniform in those regions where there is less diversity in seasons forms and all else but places which are full of contrarieties the extremes of beauty and terror where opposite situations and swift sensations are experienced uplift the imagination of certain temperaments towards the romantic the mysterious the ideal pastures that are invariably temperate may produce profound scholars sands that are scorched for ever may boast ascetics and gymnosophists but mountainous greece cold and mild severe and smiling the greece of snow and of olive trees had orpheus homer epimenides 
caledonia more inhospitable more variable more polar and less favoured gave us ossian when the trees the floods the clouds are peopled by the souls of ancestors the spirits of heroes by dryads and divinities when viewless beings are bound in caverns or driven before the winds when they wander among silent tombs when their moans fill the air during the darksome night what a fatherland for the heart of man what a world for eloquence beneath a sky which never changes on some boundless plain tall palm-trees are shading the banks of a vast and soundless river and there sits the mussel-man on his cushion smoking the whole day amidst fans waved about him but moss-grown rocks project over an abyss of rising waves through a long winter the dense mist has cut them off from the world now the sky is lovely the violet and the strawberry are in bloom the days lengthen the forests awake on the tranquil ocean the daughters of warriors chant the victories and the hope of the fatherland see the clouds gathering the sea chafes the bolt shatters the ionian oak ships are swallowed up the snow covers the heights floods overwhelm the cabin and open out the precipices the wind changes the sky is clear and cold floating planks may be seen by the light of the stars on the still threatening sea the daughters of the warriors are no more the winds die down there is calm everywhere human voices are heard above the rocks and cold drops distil from the caves the caledonian arms he starts forth in the night he crosses mountains and torrents he flies to fingal crying to him slissama is dead but i have heard her voice she will not depart from us she has called thy friends she has bade us go forth to conquer the heroism of enthusiasm and the titanic dreams of a sublime melancholy seem native to the north to the south belong austere conceptions mystic reveries impenetrable dogmas secret magical cabalistic sciences and the intense enthusiasms of hermits the admixture of races and the complexity of causes whether connected with climate or foreign thereto by which the temperament of man is modified have furnished specious arguments against the great influence of climates for the rest it would seem that no one has done more than glance at the means and effects of this influence regard has been paid only to the greater or lesser heat which so far from being the sole cause is not perhaps even the chief were it possible that the sum of yearly heat were the same in norway and in hejaz the difference would still be very great it may be as great as ever between arab and norwegian the one is acquainted only with an unvaried nature equality in days permanence in season and the burning uniformity of a barren land the other after a long series of dense mists and frost-bound earth of congealed waters and a heaven riven by the winds beholds a new season illuminate the sky periodically restore life to the waters and fructify an earth bursting everywhere into blossom and embellished by harmonious hues and romantic sounds hours of inexpressible beauty are found in spring autumn has days rendered still more alluring by the very sadness which imbues without distracting the soul which instead of rending it with false delight permeates and nourishes it with a rapture which is full of mystery of grandeur and of weariness possibly the diverse aspects of the earth and the heavens and the permanence or mobility of the accidents of nature can impress only well organized men and cannot reach that multitude which either through incapacity or misery would seem condemned to know only the animal instincts but men of wider faculties are the men who lead their country those who by institutions by example by open or secret forces carry away the crowd and the crowd itself in many ways responds to these impulsions although it does not observe them among such causes one of the palmary is indubitably in the atmosphere with which we are penetrated the vegetable and terrestrial emanations and exhalations 
change with the culture of the ground and with other circumstances when even the temperature is not sensibly modified hence when it is proved that the inhabitants of a given country have become modified in the absence of a corresponding climatic alteration it seems to me that a substantial objection has not been alleged for the argument is only as to temperature and at the same time the air of one place must seldom suit the inhabitants of another though the summers and winters appear similar moral and political causes operate at first more powerfully than the influence of climate they have an immediate and rapid effect which overcomes physical causes though the latter being more durable are more potent in the end no one is surprised that the parisians have changed since the period when julian wrote his misopogon in place of the old parisian character the force of circumstances has substituted one which is blended of the dwellers in a very large unmaritime town with that of the picards the normans the chapenois Turingo, the gascon the french in general europeans even and finally the subjects of a monarchy which has been ameliorated in its external forms End of section forty six section forty seven of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by etienne piver de senancour translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two eighth year letters seventy one and seventy two letter seventy one immenstrom august three eight if there be one thing in the pageant of the world which strikes me from time to time and from time to time astonishes me it is that being who to us appears the end of so many means and would yet seem the means to no end who is all on earth and yet for earth as nothing while he is nothing also for himself who searches combines distresses himself who remakes and yet does the new things invariably after the same manner and those things which are everlastingly the same with a hope that is ever new whose nature is activity or rather the unrest of activity who exerts himself to find what he seeks but torments himself still more when he has nothing to seek for who in that which he attains sees only a means to the attainment of something different and amidst the fruition of his joy finds in that which he desired only new strength to strive after what he did not want previously who would covet what he once dreaded rather than have nothing to expect further whose greatest misfortune would be the absence of all opportunity of suffering whom obstacles enchant whom pleasures oppress who loves rest only when he has lost it and hurried from illusions to illusions has and can look for nothing beyond them who has known in fine no more of life than its dream letter seventy two immenstrom august six eight i am scarcely surprised that your friends blame me for burying myself in an isolated and unknown place this was not only to be expected but i must agree with them that my tastes seem contradictory at times i think all the same that the opposition is more apparent than real and will be observable by those only who credit me with a decided bias towards a rural life my attraction is by no means exclusively towards what is termed living in the country nor do i dislike the town i know well enough which of the two lives i prefer naturally but i should be puzzled to decide which of them suits me altogether at this moment as regards the mere question of some place to settle down in most towns i should find uncongenial yet there are perhaps none that i should not prefer to the country as i have seen it in many provinces if i tried to picture the situation which suited me best it would not be in a town still i give no decided preference to the country although for any one in unfavourable circumstances existence may be more tolerable in the latter 
i consider that with adequate means there is fuller opportunity in large towns for living comfortably according to the possibilities of the place the whole question is therefore subject to so many exceptions that i am unable to offer any general decision concerning it what i like is not this or that definitely and exclusively but what seems to me nearest to perfection in its own way and most fully in harmony with its own nature i should prefer the existence of a miserable finlander amidst his frozen rocks to that which is led by innumerable small burgesses of certain towns wherein wholly circumscribed by their customs pallid with discontent and living like mere animals they hold themselves superior to the careless and robust being who vegetates in the country and laughs through all his sundays i am well enough pleased with a small town when it is clean nicely placed and tastefully built with a park pleasantly laid out as a public promenade in place of insipid boulevards where there is a broad walk in which beautiful fountains play where people who may be neither out of the common nor celebrated nor even highly educated but are yet right thinking and not devoid of wit can assemble although in small numbers and be glad to meet in a word a small town where there is the least possible amount of misery meanness discord scandal homespun piety and calumny but better still i like the great town which combines all the advantages and attractions of human industry where polished manners and enlightened minds are found where amidst the vast population one may expect to meet with a friend and to form desirable acquaintances where one can be lost if need be in the crowd be at once respected untrammelled and unnoticed following the bent of one's inclination or changing it unobtrusively where everything can be chosen and arranged and adopted with no other judges than the persons who truly know us paris is the capital which unites all town advantages in the highest degree and hence though i have most probably quitted it for ever i cannot be surprised that so many persons of taste and sensibility prefer it to any other abode if unfitted for the occupations of the country one is alien therein the requisite faculties are wanting for the life that has been chosen and we are conscious that we should have done better in another condition though at the same time we might have appreciated or approved it less rural pursuits are necessary for a rural life and they can scarcely be adopted when youth is no longer ours we need arms capable of toil we must take interest in planting grafting and haymaking with our own hands and we must be fond of hunting or fishing otherwise we are out of our element and likely to say to ourselves at paris i should experience no such discomfort my habits would be in conformity with my environment though neither might harmonize with my real tastes thus our place in the order of the world is lost when we have been separated from it too long our disposition and our affections are denaturalized by fixed habits contracted in youth and should it come to pass in the end that we become wholly free we can choose no longer as we ought except approximately nothing henceforward is wholly suitable at paris one is well off for a time but not as it seems to me for all life nor does it appear man's nature to dwell everlastingly among the bricks between the tiles and the mud cut off from the majestic scenes of nature the elegances of society are by no means devoid of value our fancies are carried away by their distraction at the same time they do not fill the soul nor compensate for all that has been lost society cannot satisfy him who has no other resource in the town who is not deceived by the promises of an empty clamour and is acquainted with the misery of pleasures undoubtedly if there be one truly satisfactory condition it is that of a landholder who devoid of other cares free of profession or passions tranquil in an agreeable domain manages prudently his estate his house his family and himself and disassociated from the success and bitterness of the world seeks only to enjoy day by day 
recurring and simple pleasures that sweet but enduring joy which every day can renew with a wife who is similarly disposed with one or two children one intimate friend and in fine with health an adequate estate pleasantly situated and the spirit of order we have all the felicity which a wise man can cherish in his heart some of these advantages are mine but he who has ten wants falls short of happiness when nine only are fulfilled such is man and so is he necessarily constituted complaint would ill become me and yet am i remote from felicity i do not in any sense regret paris but i remember a conversation which i once had with a distinguished officer who had just retired from active service and taken up his abode in that city i was at the house of m t towards evening there were other visitors but they went down into the garden and remained there while beer was brought up to us subsequently our host left us and i remained alone with the officer in question certain parts of our talk have become fixed in my memory how we came upon the subject and whether the beer after dinner accounted for our loquacity i cannot say however it may be here is what took place almost literally you will observe in due course that my interlocutor was a man who never calculated on growing tired of amusing himself nor could he be deceived in this respect because he claimed to subordinate his very amusements to an order peculiar to himself and thus render them the instruments of a species of passion which will end only with him finding his views remarkable and having a clear recollection of them next morning i wrote them down to preserve among my notes i enclose them herewith indolence prevents me from copying them but you will return them later on i wanted a profession and i had one i found that it led to no good at least in my case i found further that there was but one external thing which was worth troubling about and that is money it is a necessity and it is no less good to possess it in sufficiency than it is essential not to seek for it immoderately gold is a power it represents every faculty of man since it opens all paths and entitles to all enjoyments nor do i see that it is less useful to the good man than to the voluptuary if he would fulfil his objects like others i have been duped by the thirst for observation and knowledge which i have carried too far i have learned with a deal of labour many things which were useless to human reason and these i forget from henceforth i will not deny that there is a certain pleasure in such forgetfulness but i have paid for it too high a price i have travelled somewhat i have lived in italy i have crossed russia i have even had a glimpse of china these journeys wearied me not a little but when i had done with business i desired to travel for pleasure foreigners spoke only of your alps and i explored them as others have done you were compensated for the dullness of the russian steppes i ascertained the colour of the snow in summer the hardness of the alpine granite the rapidity of the waterfalls and a number of similar things but seriously you were dissatisfied with the experience and have brought away no agreeable memory no memorable observation i know the shape of the copper pans in which they make cheeses and am qualified to pronounce on the accuracy of the topographical pictures of switzerland i can recognize when the artists have given play to their fancy as they do frequently what matters it to me if rocks hurled by a certain number of men have crashed down on a greater number who chance to be underneath if the snow and the northeast wind prevail for nine months in the meadows where such an astonishing occurrence took place formerly i shall not select them for my asylum now i am gratified to learn that a considerable number of people earn bread and beer in amsterdam by discharging casks of coffee but as for me i can get good coffee elsewhere without breathing the evil air of holland and without being frozen at hamburg every country has its good points and it is argued that there are fewer bad ones at paris than at any other place i do not pretend to decide but my ways consort with paris and there i shall remain with good sense and a competence we can suit ourselves wherever sociable beings exist our heart our head and our purse do more for our happiness than places 
i have met with monstrous licentiousness in the deserts of the volga i have found ridiculous pretensions in the humble valleys of the alps at astrakhan at lausanne at naples man groans even as at paris he laughs at paris as he does at lausanne or naples everywhere the poor suffer and the rest torment themselves it is true that parisian amusements are not altogether the way in which i should wish to see the people amused but it must be admitted also that i should fail elsewhere to find more agreeable society or a more convenient mode of life i have abandoned those fantasies which absorb time inordinately as well as resources i have only one dominant taste or if you will one craze remaining of which i am never likely to be quit as there is nothing chimerical about it and it does not occasion serious embarrassment for an empty end i like to get the best return for my time my money and my entire being the passion for order occupies more fully and produces more than other passions while it sacrifices nothing to utter loss happiness is less costly than our pleasures granted but of what kind of happiness are we speaking to spend the days in play dining talking of the latest actress all this may be pleasant enough as you point out so well but such a life will by no means constitute happiness for persons of great ambition you are in search of powerful sensations and extreme emotions it is the thirst of a generous soul and at your age may still mislead as for myself i care little to be in admiration for an hour and in weariness for a week i prefer rather a frequent diversion with no weariness my way of living does not fatigue me because i combine it with order and to this order i adhere such is my version of our conversation which lasted a full hour in the same strain i confess that if he did not reduce me to silence he at least gave me material in plenty for reflection End of section forty seven section forty eight of obermann this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org obermann by etienne piver de senancour translated by arthur edward waite eighteen fifty seven to nineteen forty two eighth year letter seventy three and ninth year letters seventy four and seventy five letter seventy three imenstrom september eight you leave me to inexpressible solitude with whom shall i abide when you are roaming beyond the seas now indeed i am about to be alone you assure me that this will be no protracted voyage it is possible but shall i gain much by your return the new functions which engross you unceasingly have made you forget my mountains and the promise which you gave me did you think bordeaux so very near to the alps i shall not attempt writing until you return i have no relish for those speculative letters which reach the intended recipient by chance only while an answer cannot come to hand till at least three months have elapsed and may not arrive for a year as to myself having no intention of departing from hence i shall hope to hear from you on your voyage i regret that m de fonsalbe has business to finish at hamburg before he can transact that at zurich but as he foresees that the former will be prolonged possibly the inclement season will be over before he reaches switzerland so you can arrange matters accordingly just as they were planned for the autumn be sure that you do not start till he has promised decisively to make a stay here of at least several days judge whether this is of moment to me of you i have no hope leave me some one at least whom you have loved what you tell me regarding him would give me unbounded satisfaction if i could be affected by plans so remote of fulfilment i have no longer any wish to believe in the happy issue of uncertainties letter 
seventy four imenstrom june fifteen ninth year the arrival of your note has filled me with extravagant joy bordeaux for a moment has seemed to me closer to my lake than port au prince or l'île de Jorée. so your affairs have flourished this counts for much it is something for the soul to feed upon when no other nourishment is available as for me i am steeped in profound weariness which is not as you know of my seeking on the contrary i would find occupation and yet i perish of inanition it is desirable that i should be as brief as you are i am at imenstrom i have heard nothing of m de fonsalbe and furthermore i no longer hope for anything notwithstanding farewell see wales bene est june sixteen when i think how you live at once well employed and tranquil now finding interest in what you do and now enjoying those distractions which bring rest i am on the verge of blaming independence though i love it all the same it is undeniable that man stands in need of some object to engage him some controlling influence to lead and govern him at the same time it is a great advantage to be free to choose what is suited to one's means and to be different from the slave who works unremittingly for another but i have ample time for testing all the futility and vanity of what i do and this frigid estimate of the true worth of things is next door to disgust with them all you are selling chessel and purchasing in the neighbourhood of bordeaux must we never meet again how right you were for all that each of us must work out his destiny it is insufficient to appear contented i ought to be so it would seem and yet i am not happy when you have attained happiness send me some sauterne till then i do not wish for it to you o oh good and wise man whose heart obeys his reason whom i admire and cannot imitate to you happiness will come you know how to use life but for me i await it i seek the beyond for ever as if the hours were not lost as if eternal death were not nearer than my dreams letter seventy five imenstrom june twenty eight nine i will look forward no longer to better days the months slip by the years succeed one another all renews itself in vain i continue that which i was in the midst of all that i desired all is wanting to me i have acquired nothing i possess nothing weariness expends my duration in a lingering silence whether the ineffectual anxieties of life constrain me to forget natural things whether the barren need of enjoyment drives me to their shadow the void environs me all my days and each season seems to extend it further about me no friendship consoled my weariness through the long sea mists of the winter spring comes for nature but for me it arrives not the season of quickening reawakens all existence its invincible fire exhausts without reanimating me i have become as an alien in the joyful world and now the flowers have fallen the time of the lily is overpast the heat increases days lengthen and the nights are more lovely o oh, season of enchantment but days of beauty to me are useless the sweet nights to me are bitter peace of the deep shadows washing of the waves silence moon birds singing in the night-time sensations of the early years what has become of you the ghosts remain they appear before me they pass repass and withdraw as a cloud changing into a hundred pallid and titanic forms i seek in vain to enter with tranquillity into the night of the tomb my eyes refuse to close these ghosts of life show themselves unceasingly they disport in silence they approach and draw back are swallowed up and reappear i behold them all and i hear nothing they are like smoke i seek them and they are no more i listen and call my own voice is not audible and i dwell in an intolerable emptiness alone 
lost uncertain overborne with disquietude and amazement in the midst of wandering shades in space impalpable and dumb unfathomable nature i am overwhelmed by thy splendour and thy very benefits consume me what for me are these long days their light begins too early their burning noon exhausts me and the distressing harmony of their heavenly evening consumes the ashes of my heart the genius which slept beneath its ruins has trembled at the movement of life the snows melt upon the mountain crowns the stormy clouds surge in the valley ah wretched that i am the heavens kindle the earth ripens but sterile winter abides in me soften beams of the dying sun grand shadows of enduring snows oh that man should have only embittered joys when the torrent rolls afar in the universal silence when the chalets close for the rest of the night when the moon rises over Vélan. from the moment that i left behind me that infancy which we all regret i imagined i was conscious of a real life yet i experienced only fantastic sensations i beheld the beings of the mind but here are shadows only i sought after harmony and found nothing but its antithesis then i became a prey to sadness the void made furrows in my heart wants with no limit devoured me in silence and weariness of life became my sole sentiment at the age when most people are beginning to live everything bodied forth to me that full universal felicity the ideal image of which is graved in the heart of man while its means which seem so natural seem also blotted out from nature as yet i toyed merely with unknown sorrows but when i looked upon the alps and upon the shores of the lakes when i was in the presence of the silence of the chalets of the permanence and the equality of times and of outward things i recognized the isolated marks of this preconceived nature i saw the reflections of the moon upon schists of rock and upon eaves of wood i beheld men without desires i roamed over the close-cropped mountain grass i hearkened to the sound of another world once more i came down to earth and then the unquestioning faith in absolute existence evaporated that chimera of harmonious correspondences perfections positive delights that brilliant figment with which the unwithered heart beguiles itself and at which they smile so woefully who are chilled by a greater profundity or ripened by a later time mutations without term activity which knows not end universal impenetrability such is the limit of our knowledge concerning this world over which we reign some invincible destiny cancels all our dreams and what does it supply in the space which must yet be filled power wearies delight slips away glory turns to ashes religion is a system for the wretched love once wore the colours of life but the shadow comes the rose pales it falls and behold it is the eternal night great was our soul notwithstanding it willed a task was set it what has it performed i have seen unmoved some ancient tree which had fructified through two centuries lie prone and death-stricken on the earth it has nourished living creatures it has received them into its refuge it has drunk the moisture of the air and has subsisted in despite of stormy winds it perishes amidst other trees born of its fruit its destiny is fulfilled it has obtained that which was promised it it is no longer it has once been but the sapling set by chance on the marsh edge it sprang up wild in its strength and its pride even as the tree of the forest depths superabundant energy the roots drink up fetid water they strike into an impure slime the stem is enfeebled and weary 
bowed by the humid winds its head relaxes repeatedly its fruits few and sickly fall into the slough and there are lost to no purpose languishing misshapen sear prematurely old and already bent over the marsh it seems to seek the tempest which will uproot it its life has ceased long before its fall end of section forty eight